Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing another episode of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights. So this will be part 115, so quite a lot of them happening of course, so we'll be using this to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today with part 115, we've got a few fish mods coming back, we've got a couple new fish mods as well and we've got a couple extinct animals and a really really cool little mammal that I'm really excited to talk off as, uh, talk about as well. But yeah, we're going to be starting off today with some fish. Uh, we got our first animal today, the black paku, also known as the tamanuki, if you say that, by Buffsu Leaf and the model has been ported directly from Fishing Planet. So, the tamanuki or the black paku or the scientific name Colossuma macroporum these guys are a species of freshwater fish from the family Ceramosidae, and these guys come from tropical South America, and but can be as has been kept in aquaculture and been introduced to other places around the world. Also known as the black paku, or the black fin paku, or the giant paku, a couple of very interesting names. In terms of its habitat, these guys are native to freshwater habitats in the Amazon and Orinoco basins of South America, where they typically live in nutrient rich waters, but they can be found in like black waters and turbicies, but typically they're like uh, nutrient rich uh, right water uh, rivers, primarily. In terms of their size, these guys are actually the largest charakan in the Americas, which is quite interesting. And the second heaviest scaled fish in South America, so they're second only to the Arapama, which is one of the largest freshwater fish in the world. These guys can typically reach, let's see if you can find one swimming around, I think they're all kind of hanging out here, let's move you so we can... Oh, we'll have to go for this one. Anyway, these guys, I know, a bit of a... <laughs> Walking fish is a bit terrible, but anyway, these guys can get to about 1.1 meters or 3 feet 6 inches long and uh, weigh about 44 kilograms or 97 pounds. Uh, that's how big they can get, but they typically get between uh, up to about 7, 0 0.7 meters or about 2.3 feet. Uh, the largest caught in rod and reel, though, was also about 32.4 kilograms, or 71 pounds. And they can get a little bit heavier because they'll pack on a lot of weight after the flood season. And uh, they can be up to like 10 to 50% of the body can be like uh, visceral fat, which is quite interesting. Their bodies are quite similar in shape to the piranha, and they are related to piranhas. And they're often the juveniles when they're younger, sometimes confused with them. But what really sets these guys apart is their teeth. As you can see, they've got very human-shaped molars, and these molars are adapted to break through hard things, so like shells and of uh, nuts and fruits, which is really really interesting. And you can see the remaining body; they're mostly grey. They get them in the black paku because of this lower part of their body is all uh, black and things like that. Uh, they also have quite roundish body with these large jaws uh, to crush these nuts and things. Uh, also smaller fins, things like that, especially pectoral fins. But um, in terms of their habitat and breeding, these guys are mostly solitary species, but will join together in large schools sometimes. Oh, there's one diving. We'll have a look at you. Uh, they'll join together in large schools. Uh, they typically spend their non-breeding time in flooded forests during the wet season. Uh, and they'll stay in there to four to seven months, eating and uh, staying in there. But as the water drops, they'll move either into whitewater rivers and floodplains. And at the start of the next flood season, kind of, they'll go off and move into the uh, whitewater rivers where they will spawn, typically at about November to February. Uh, these exact, exact spawning locations are typically not known, but um, apparently they like to spawn across woody shores and grassy levees. And the school will then break apart after they've spawned and um, they will uh, return to these uh, flood uh, blackwater rivers and that pandan's repeated. Though larvae of black paku have been found in whitewater rivers, including inside the Amazon itself. And juveniles will stay near macrophytes and floodplains and flooded forests year round. But then when they start to breed or reach maturity, they will move on into the, the migrating pattern. And they typically will start this uh, breeding when they reach about 60 centimeters or about 2 feet long. And the species actually regular makes it up to 40 years of age and may live up to 65. In terms of its uh, uh, other adaptions it have, because it's living in sometimes smaller lakes where there's not enough oxygen, uh, they actually can take in oxygen from the air, and they'll do this by um, taking air into their swim bladder, and uh, the blood vessel is very much like a very simple lung, which is really, really cool. And younger uh, fish... 
uh, especially younger um, black Paku, actually quite like uh, salinity, so they can survive in salinity. Waters with high salinity, up to about like 20 uh, grams per liter, which results in death, typically. But uh, they can be... They, they don't do well, but they can survive. But in terms of their diet, another really important thing for these fish, uh, these guys consume fruits and seeds, especially from like woody angiosperms and herbaceous species. And depending on the quality of their food is where they can be found. Uh, in one study it actually shows that like 70 to 98% of their gut contents was fruit. That they mostly eat fruits and seeds and um, fruits and nuts and things. They will eat also eat wild rice, uh, zooplankton, small shrimps, snails, insects, algae, and sometimes even decaying plants. So mostly fruits and seeds and things, but generalist. And another interesting fact as well is that they're really important for dispersing seeds and um, things like that across oceans. Uh, the Often, obviously, the seeds will fall in the water and these guys will eat it. And an adult paku, can, especially at like around 10 kilograms, can have a kilogram of uh, seeds and stuff in its stomach. And as it swims around and poops it out, it spreads the seeds. And they're quite important for uh, dispersing seeds, similar to like birds and monkeys in that regard. So they're quite important for the ecosystems that they live in. In terms of their relationship to humans, the flesh of these guys is quite popular and can be quite a high price in the market of their native range. And while populations have declined a lot because of overfishing, uh, even in like some areas, the um, landings have gone from like 15,000 metric tons into the 1970s to 800 metric tons in 1996. So uh, that shows that they can be susceptible to uh, overfishing. But luckily, they are widely kept in aquaculture because they can... Uh, live in relatively pure nutrient waters and are very resistant to, oh, I mean, poor oxygen waters and quite resistant to diseases. And they're also being introduced to other places such as Hong Kong and Singapore and adapted to the local conditions and escaping from, obviously, fish farms. And um, they've also been found in Puerto Rico and can be caught in some U.S. states where it's warm enough. And another thing as well is that uh, juveniles that are between 5 to 7.5 centimeters or two to three inches long are sometimes called vegetarian piranha uh, but they're frequently seen in the aquarium trade but they're not actually vegetarian piranha they will grow out and get really big and uh you're not going to do don't know what to do with a two foot long fish and that's what happens with people release them and that's how they can become invasive so very very not good uh for the fish and people should be selling young fish like that but really really cool animal definitely a big fan of this guy so that was done by Leaf, Buffsu, and again, Porter from Fishing Planet. This next mod was done the same. It's uh, Leaf and Buffsu made it, and the model was Porter from Fishing Planet. We have got here the red tailed catfish. So the red tailed catfish is a really, really cool catfish. These guys are a or a long whiskered catfish, uh, and they are typically found in many places they can be found in uh, the Amazon, the Orinoco and Isaquello river basins as well uh, where they typically live in fresh water and inhabit large rivers, streams and ponds. Uh, they also can be found uh, during the evening and night but they stay motionless during the day as they forage and um, they are bottom dwellers and tend to hang around these bottoms quite uh, slowly and they're quite territorial as well so they will protect their habitat from other fish or uh, well, their territories from other fish. And they've become an invasive species in places such as Malaysia and can be found at the Penang and Penang River. So what's really interesting about these fish, these guys can get quite big as you can see here. The, um, the species can get up to about 1.8 meters or about just shy of 6 feet long and weigh about 80 kilograms or 180 pounds. Though this is an exceptional specimen, um, most typically get on average about 3 foot 6 inches or 4 foot 6 inches or between 1.1 and 1.4 meters in length. And you can see they're colorful uh, catfish with like a dark back and this white yellowish band around here. And you can see they get the name the red tail because of the red across the back fins here, which is quite cool. And they have a broad head, as you can see there, with a large mouth to catch prey. And these long whiskers that have chemoreceptors that allow them to feel around uh, in the mud and also detect certain chemicals in the water, which is quite interesting. They will also breed through external fertilization after laying their eggs, and they can communicate by making a clicking sound that uh, warns off potential predators, which is quite interesting. Uh, in terms of their relationship to humans, these guys are quite large and they have a potentially large species. So 
They're often considered a game fish by a lot of anglers. Uh, the current record is uh, about, uh, for catching these guys, about 56 kilograms or 123 pounds. And natives do not actually eat the meat of the fish because it's black and because of the coloration. And then, as I mentioned, they're also introduced to places such as Thailand as well. But in terms of aquariums, they're quite a common uh, occurrence in public aquaria, uh, especially in the Amazon themes because they can be housed with, housed with other fish like paku and arapaimas and things like that. And juveniles can often be seen in the private uh, aquarium trade as juvenile fish. But because they grow so big eventually, uh, a lot of people shouldn't be buying them. You need to be prepared for having a, a tank that's at least 10,000 litres or 2,600 gallons for an adult catfish. And usually weakling feeding, weekly feeding is good for these guys. And overfeeding can be a common cause of death. And especially as young fish as well, you can't really house them with anything too small because they're just going to eat it. Like duck guppies or tetras. And um, they've also been known to swallow a lot of inanimate objects within their aquariums. And that can be a, a, pr be a problem for the fish. And it's best to keep objects that they can swallow out of aquariums that they are in. They've also been hybridized with other fish, such as Pseudoplastomia or the tiger chauvinose catfish. And through the use of hormones that create hybrids and a viable food source, the tiger red tail catfish, which is quite interesting. But yeah, really, really cool animals. Do love these red tail catfish. Again, done by Leaf uh, uh, Buffsu, and the model comes from Fishing Planet. So next up, we've got another mod by uh, Leaf and Jen and Buffsu. So the dream team kind of bring back the Aquaria pack. So we've got here the yellowtail amberjack. Oh, yellowtail amberjack. Why is it not? There we are. Why is it not even letting me? There we are. Got the yellowtail amberjack or the yellowtail kingfish. We're going to call it kingfish from now on because that's what we call it. So the uh, yellowtail kingfish, they're a large fish found in the southern oceans. Uh, these guys are typically found in tropical to temperate uh Waters across the Southern Ocean. They can be found in Chile, up through Tasmania and Northern Australia. I believe even up into Japan and around New Zealand as well. So quite a wide range. These guys, uh, the kingfish, are a highly pelagic species. So they're like open water. And they tend to form shoals with either single species uh, shoals. So just, just kingfish. Or they will hang out with species such as silver trevally or blue t uh, bluefin tuna. And they typically prefer water temperatures of between 17 and 24 degrees Celsius. Typically, they'll inhabit quite rocky reefs and adjacent sand areas uh, in like coastal waters and occasionally will also enter estuaries. These fish are giving me bad luck today. They're all on land when I'm trying to talk about them swimming. But anyway, uh, they typically live in these coastal areas and sometimes will enter estuaries. Uh, they form shallow water down to depths of up to 50 meters. But they can also be caught in waters up to about over 300. Typically, younger fish are at about 7 kilograms, are known to shoal in quite large shoals of several hundred fish. And they can be generally found across the coast, while these larger adults can be found in deep reefs or offshore islands. With juveniles being really seen, and they often can be found quite far from land, hanging around with um, like uh, plastics and uh, floating logs and things to use for camouflage. And juveniles are typically yellow with black bands, but this coloration does fade with age. And uh, once they reach about 30 centimeters long, they will have their adult coloration. Very sadly, there's not that much known actually about uh, their biology, but um, we know that adults live in like rocky reefs and rocky outcrops of a maximum depth of about 300 meters. Uh, maximum length for an adult is about 180 centimeters long and large kingfish have been caught that get about 40 to 50 kilograms So quite a big fish and they can be found in all sorts of different harbors and lots of people will catch them Especially around like Sydney Harbor things like that Where they like to hang out, but in terms of behavior these guys are a uh, Very curious fish and like to hang around human vessels and they often will associate with stingrays because they take advantage of the uh, electroreception that the stingrays have, and that can help find fish uh, in the uh, like silt in the bottom of the ocean, which is quite cool. But in terms of these guys, they're highly active predators, usually in shoals or pairs, and uh, their main diet consists of bait fish, so they include like yellowtail mackerel, uh, squid, prawns, garfish, and kawai. And they're also one of the major predators of New Zealand waterways and will eat uh, seabirds, which is quite interesting. So in terms of uh, 
uh, in a human context, they've often been considered a traditional food for the Maori people of New Zealand. And um, they often use catching hooks and like using power shells, things like that. Early Europeans actually disliked the fish, but um, because they taste to be flavorless and coarse, but a lot of people love this fish. And even I love eating kingfish. It's very nice. And one thing as well to help protect wild populations, uh, they've been uh, found quite suitable for aquaculture. And in contrast to the Japanese amberjack, uh, they've been long uh, cultivated in Japan. These guys are only just starting. And only the last 10 years or so, there's been efforts in Australia and New Zealand to try and breed them at both sea cages and large like um, land-based operations to try and breed them and sell them. So um, you don't have to take so much of the wild population. So yeah, really, really cool. Nice kingfish. Definitely love uh, seeing some nice fish around here. Nice mod, again, done by Leaf, Jen, and Buffsu. So next up, we got our last fish. Uh, this last shark uh, was done by Buffsu, Gaboy, and Leaf. We've got here the Tawny Nurse Shark. So the Tawny Nurse Shark, these guys are an interesting species of um, carpet shark. And the only extant member of the genus Nibrius, if you say that. So these guys can be found across the Indo-Pacific region. They can be found throughout South Africa, up into India, Mount Madagascar, even up to southern Japan and into the Philippines and a lot of the islands of kind of uh, the Central Pacific, like New Caledonia, things like that, uh, which is quite cool. So they are typically an inshore species, so they typically like to uh, hang around coastal and insular shells alongside like sandy flats or sea grass beds and even along the outer edges of coral reefs uh, and rocky reefs. Uh, they also may be found in the surf zone and they tend to like to hang out in deeps, uh, depths of about 5 to 30 meters, so about 16 to 98 feet and a maximum depth of about 70 meters or 230 feet. And young sharks can be found in lagoons typically for their protection, but they typically like to hang out in um, lagoons, but adults like all sorts of different habitats. In terms of their description, these guys uh, can get quite big, so they can get about 3.2 meters or about 10 feet long. And they have a robust cylindrical body, as you kind of see there, with a broad uh, rounded head and a flattened head. And they have these small barbules on their face as well. And they've got these gills going on, of course. Uh, smaller cusps on their teeth as well. They've got quite angular dorsal and pectoral fins, and uh, they're quite narrow as well. And these, uh, even the anal fins are quite narrow. And some places like Japan and Taiwan, they've been found with second uh, dorsal fins, and that's believed to be because of pregnant females being exposed to high salinity or high temperatures while being pregnant. So that's quite interesting. But in terms of their biology and ecology, um, while more streamlined than, of course, other nurse sharks, these guys are believed to be more active swimmers uh, with the characteristic like body and head fins and teeth, things like that, than a sickle fin, more similar in ecology to like a sickle fin lemon shark. But these guys are primarily nocturnal, and um, but they have been found to be active across all sorts of different uh, areas in uh, Madagascar, and in captivity they will become diurnal because that's when they're fed. But in the wild, they have uh, are preyed upon by a few different animals, such as bull sharks, uh, great hammerheads, uh, tiger sharks, lemon sharks, and things like that. But in terms of their bio, or not in terms of their biology, in terms of their feeding, these guys are one of the few species of shark that will uh, specialize on octopus. But they will also eat things such as corals, sea urchins. Uh, crustaceans, squid, and small fishes, including things like queen, uh, queen fish and rabbit fish and sturgeon fish. And even sometimes we'll eat sea snakes. Uh, hunting tawny sharks uh, swim slowly just across the seafloor. They poke their heads into depressions and holes and things. And when a prey item is found, they'll shake um, forcefully and kind of expand their uh, large mouth, which creates uh, a negative pressure. So they use suction feeding. So when they find their prey, they open their mouths, that creates negative pressure, and their prey is pretty much just sucked into their mouths and they get a feed, which is really, really interesting. 
So in terms of its life history though, they typically, Elf Madagascar will breed from July to August, and adult females only have one functional uh, ovary and two functional uteruses, and the typical mean of reproduction they use is aplacental vivipary. So basically what that is is that the mother will lay a few fertile eggs and they stay within her body, and then she'll start releasing, she still keep releasing non-fertile eggs to feed the baby inside the, uh, inside the uterus, so she doesn't have placenta. As they don't actually show evidence of things like uh, sibling cannibalism in the uterus, things like that. And typically when they're born, they get between 40 to 80 centimeters long, or about 16 to 31 inches, with a discrepancy possibly being uh, variation. And although females can release up to four fertilized eggs, typically they only give birth to one or two. Uh, that's probably because the large size. And there's even been shown there's even one, two embryos in a single uterus. One may actually be like way smaller because of competition. And uh, typically they reach sexual maturity once they're out and, um, and moving and eating, of course. They reach sexual maturity at about 2.5 meters or about 8 feet. And females will reach that same at about 7 to 9 feet, which is quite interesting. In terms of their um, kind of... Uh, in terms of their like human interactions, these guys are much more docile than a lot of sharks. Uh, people, even divers, have touched and played them, and people even in aquariums, uh, as they adapt quite well to aquariums, can go in and feed them. Though they are still quite a large animal with a powerful bite, and there have been people bitten by uh, these guys while hand feeding them. So in terms of like interaction with people, people get on well with them, but they are also taken by commercial fisheries, including places such as like. Pakistan, India, the Philippines, things like that, with an exception being Australian waters where they are protected, and they get caught for like shark fin soup and things like that, but they also get caught as bycatch with things such as like gill nets and things like that, which uh, hurts their populations. And also in Australia, they are considered a big game fish with anglers trying to catch them, uh, which is quite cool. I mean, quite interesting uh, that <laughs> that's a big game fish but sadly uh, a lot of this makes them vulnerable worldwide as they face these really heavy fishing pressures and the low reproductive rates and dispersal rates of the species because uh, they're sharks and they breed quite slow as i mentioned they only have one baby or two baby at a time and habitat degradation destructive fishing practices and exploitation of humans or humans harassing them uh, puts them at risk uh, in the wild um, but uh, luckily, they are considered least concerned in Australia because they're not targeted by fisheries. But of course, they can be still harassed by humans and things like bycatch can still be a big issue for these guys. But generally, they're doing okay. They are considered vulnerable. So, yeah, another nice one. Uh, again, this one was done by Leaf, uh, uh, Gaboy, and Buffsu. So, nice dream team back again. But next up, we're done with all the fish. We get to have a talk about some cool mammals. So this next mammal I'm really excited to talk about. So we have got here the, uh, the short-beat echidna done by Leaf and Jen. Why does it keep doing that? Uh, but anyway, the short-beat echidna, these guys are called Tachyglossus alalectris or something like that. Or well, the short-nosed uh, echidna, um, other name. So... These guys are a type of echidna, they're a monotreme, so they lay eggs, and they can be found typically across most of Australia and parts of New Guinea, uh, though there are a few different subspecies, but um, they're mostly found in Australia. They can typically get between 30 to 45 centimeters, or about 12 to 18 inches in length, with a 75 millimeter or 3 inch snout, and they weigh between 2 to 7 kilograms. And you can see they've got quite small eyes and small ear holes as well and quite a compact body and the exception of the other side they've got cream colored spines that you see here these are just modified hairs and they can get up to about two inches or about 50 millimeters and they're mostly made of keratin and they're also under that they have a layer of fur that acts as insulation so one thing that also makes them quite distinct, they've got quite large claws that are quite adapted for, and their limbs are quite well adapted for rapid digging as they've got short and strong claws. These limbs as well, they're quite stout and they've actually been shown to move like a 30 pound or 13 kilo stone, which is quite an achievement, achievement for like a 5 kilo echidna, which is quite interesting. And this is because they've got uh, strong muscles in their arms and diff uh, stronger muscle attachments that allow them to move bigger things, which is quite cool. And the claws of the hind limb, which is kind of hard to see, but they're facing backwards and they curve. And this actually allows them to clean their uh, spikes and 
clean them as well, which is quite cool. They clean and groom with their spikes using their back legs. And like platypuses, they uh, have a very low body temperature between 30 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 86 to 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 30 to 32 degrees Celsius, I mean. But unlike platypus, they actually do not often go into torpor or hibernation. And their body temperature may actually fall as low as 5 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. And they do not pat or pant or sweat. So typically during uh, to keep cool, they will either find shelter or their snout is uh, got a big bony labyrinth that has a res- uh, helps condense air as it breathes and helps cool down the air it breathes. So it then cools down the animal, which is quite interesting. And like all monotremes, they have one single orifice, which is called the cloaca. And this is where the feces and um, reproductive stuff and eggs and urine will come out of for these guys. And the male has internal testes and a four-headed penis, which is really, really weird. And it's nearly a quarter of his body length. So it's quite cool. In terms of their face, though, you can see they've got that really nice snout. And they have a long tongue that's quite sticky. It uh, also has mucus that's rich in glycoprotein that helps uh, ants and termites stick to it as it sticks its nose into and tongue into like termite and ant mounds, which is quite cool. And um, the tongue is also quite elastic, so they can quite um, able to move their tongue into any like nook and crevice they can really find. And they can eat quite quickly. So like a three kilogram echidna can eat 200 grams in 10 minutes, which is quite interesting. Another thing as well is that a lot of weird features that they have. Let's see if we can find another one. There we are. Quite a cutie. These guys uh, don't have any stomach acid, so... Most of their digestion is done in the small intestine, and basically they only have like um, pretty much uh, the formic acid in their stomachs. That's what digests kind of the insects and stuff in their gizzards and or not their gizzards, their stomachs. Um, one thing as well, they're also uh, well adapted to high concentrations of carbon dioxide of their burrows. It actually helps a lot with swimming and things like that, since they can survive floods and bushfires quite well. And they have a lot of traits that are very like mix match of things such as like reptilians and mammals, which is quite interesting. Uh, and that's quite funny. They also have ears that are quite sensitive to detecting low frequently frequency sounds, and that is believed to help them kind of find termites and ants underground, which is quite cool. And the leathery snout is actually full of mechanoreceptors and thermoreceptors that allows them to detect electrical fields and temperature with their snouts. Very similar to like our platypus would. So it's another really cool adaptation that they have for finding food. And they have a well-developed sense of smell. And it actually shows that these guys have uh, quite extensive nervous systems, more comparable to uh, placental mammals than other monotremes. Uh, or compared to platypus and they have a large prefrontal cortex which is actually quite similar in size to like that of a rat and they believe to have quite complex like problem solving skills which is really really cool but in terms of their ecology these guys typically live alone and they'll have a home range that ranges from like 50 to 400 or 500 hectares depending on the local area and how rich it is of course it's just the kind of thing that depends and they're typically active during the daytime, but since they're ill-equipped to deal with like hot body temperatures and things like that or cool down, they can become nocturnal or crepuscular if temperatures get too high. And um, in addition to that, they often will like uh, run around and do their thing. Uh, these also can live anywhere without any with any good supply of food. Uh, so they can be found pretty much all across Australia and parts of New Guinea, which is really, really cool. And they use their strong claws to dig into and find termites and things like that. So uh, in terms of uh, their habitats as well, they'll dig many burrows and use those to both uh, control their body temperature and hide from predators and things like that. So, And they're also quite important for the ecosystem health. They're considered a keystone species since they move a lot of soil. So it helps get more nutrients in and helps move the soil and gets the soil cycle going, which is quite cool. In terms of reproduction, though, these guys typically will bait between May and September with uh, the precise timing depending on where the animals are. Uh, both male and, male and females will give out a strong musky odor that uh, they secrete through their cloaca. And then the uh, tra- trains of up to 10 males will follow a female with the biggest being at the front and the youngest at the back uh, to try and follow her and things like that. 
But then they'll mate and typically uh, gestation will take about 21 to 28 days. And during that time, she'll make a, the female will make a nursery burrow. And then after that, she'll lay a single rubbery skinned egg that is between 13 to 17 millimeters or 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 inches and weighs between 1.5 to 2 grams and is laid from her cloaca directly into a small pouch that is she developed. And then the small oval egg that's like a creamy color, um, she'll carry it around and 10 days after it's laid, uh, laid the egg will hatch within this pouch and um, uh, they'll often dig and things like that. The embryo will also develop an egg tooth, which they use to tear open the egg and it disappears soon after hatching, which is quite cool. Let's have a look at you while we talk about you. Hatch things are typically about 1.5 centimeters long or about 0 0.6 inches and weigh between 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 grams. And their young echidnas are known as puggles, which is the cutest thing. And these young babies are pretty much like they have no uh, spikes and um, they climb up to their mother's chest. And um, the mother doesn't have, have nipples, so they have um, areolae, which are patches of skin that actually release milk. So they'll just lap up the milk from that area. And then they start putting on size. Uh, typically, they'll get bigger and bigger, and the uh, spikes will develop, which causes the mother a little bit of irritation. Then she'll kick them out and hang it after lay hand out in the burrow as she goes foraging. And then once she gets, they get big enough. Uh, the baby will go off on their own. Typically, they will reach sexual maturity in about four to five years, and they've been known to live uh, on an average lifespan of about 10 years, though they can live up to 40. And um, there have been some people breeding them in captivity and things like that, which is quite cool. In terms of their uh, conservation, though, they're quite common around Australia. They can be found most around temperate Australia and lowland New Guinea, and they're not listed as endangered. Though most common threats to these guys in terms of humans are uh, motor vehicles and habitat destruction, which has caused local extinctions. These guys are less affected by land clearance by a lot of species, but they still can be kicked out by things such as like, um, as long as they have enough termites and things, they're typically fine, but they can't really survive if there's lots of hard, like wheat fields and places like that. So that's where they kind of go locally extinct. Um, but despite their spines, especially young echidnas can be preyed upon by animals such as uh, birds of prey, Tasmanian devils, dingle, dingoes, snakes, lizards, goannas, cats and foxes. Uh, and almost all the victims are young, but once they get an adult, uh, they're typically safe. Though dingoes will flip them over and attack their sensitive underbellies. And um, they were also eaten by traditional uh, Abor Australians or indigenous Australians or Aborigines. Um, uh, but that's kind of... Uh, they've disappeared because uh, people have become increasingly westernized and kind of been eating them more so that's a little bit of a concern but they all can be kept in captivity relatively easily but they are hard to breed uh, there's been only about 2015 was like the first time uh, they have been successfully bred in like Perth Zoo and there's other zoos that have bred them though which is quite cool really really awesome animal I do love uh, wonderful echidna again done by Leaf and Jen so next up, we've got another very interesting animal. This is done by Gaboy and Genora Pizza. We've got Everyone Loves Horses. So we have got here the European Wild Horse, also known as the Tarpan, and I'll get into that. So the Tarpan refers to a free-ranging horse uh, that is was found in the Eurasian steppes between the 18th and the 20th century. And it's unknown whether these horses were genuine wild horses, feral uh, domestic horses, or hybrids. And hybrids are argues the most likely. But um, these guys were first kind of described in like 1771 as Equus ferris. And it's debated where these uh, Eurasian ones, which was found across like the Eurasian steppes, of course. Then uh, the Russian steppes, they were either tarpans or like hybrids between Boswellskis and domestic horses. Or just uh, feral horses or actual never domesticated horses. So it's kind of an interesting debate there. In terms of their appearance... Uh, the last individual that died in captivity in 1909 was measured between 140 and 145 centimeters or 55 to 57 inches or for you horse people about 13 to 14 hands tall at the shoulder and had a thick failing mane, a grillo coat color and some primitive markings. But because of cave paintings from the uh, Pleistocene or early Holocene, uh, we have lots of different colors for the potential uh, European wild horse and include bay, black and leopard colors. And a lot of those are shown off here. We've got about six color variants for this mod. So I'll just show a couple off as we go through. 
And these have been depicted in cave paintings uh, uh, from these horses in the Pleistocene, which is really, really cool. But um, whether they were obviously pure horses and things like that, we really don't know. But in terms of the history, we know that these wild horses uh, in the Pleistocene range throughout southern France into Spain and east of Russia. And there's been pre-domesticated horses found in southern Russia and things like that. And then there's been some populations found, quote-unquote, like the forest tarpan and things like that. Hypotheticals that were said to be quite fierce and uh, looked just quite similar. In the 16th century, though, in the east of Persia, they were still quite common in the 15th to 16th century. And um, they were described as kind of small-bodied, with large and thick heads, these short fuzzy manes, and um, short tail hair with these uh, pinned ears. And they had all sorts of different, like, faint brownish coats. And they also reported some pretty obvious domestic coat colours. Uh, so it's very likely that these, if these horses uh, were kind of never domesticated horses, it's very likely that they still hybridised with uh, domestic horses, that are more feral horses they put out. And kind of the latest ones in the 18th or 19th century, uh, there was uh, herds of these horses that ranged from, like, a few to a hundred individuals, uh, uh, they were often mixed with domestic horses, and alongside pure herds, there were herds of feral horses or hybrids. The alleged colours of these pure taipans were considered to be brown, cream-coloured, or mouse-coloured, with short, uh, frizzy black manes, and as well as black like tails and black legs. Uh, it also had ears of varying sizes and eyes, small eyes, and they looked more like mules, apparently, which makes sense. This kind of looks more like a mule to me. But yeah, really, really awesome mod, I have to say. In terms of uh, their extinction, the uh, human caused extinction of the wild horses began since like antiquity because people liked eating horses. Uh, basically, we hunted them into extinction in a lot of places. Tarpans lived uh, in the southern parts of the Russian steppe. Uh, and then eventually, as more hunting went on, potentially both hunting and hybridization with domestic horses most likely led to their extinction, with the last one, uh, last captive Taipan, dying in 1909 in a Russian zoo. Which kind of sucks. But there's actually been people trying to breed back a tarpan or something that looks like a tarpan. Been a couple attempts of like that. There are some feral breeds or, or like ancient breeds like the Connor Horse and uh, uh, Shetland Ponies and Exmoor Ponies that have been alleged uh, wild horses or have DNA from wild horses, but that's not been proven. But going back into like uh, the 1930s, uh, Lutz Heck and Heinz Heck of Murat Zoo in Berlin actually began to, a program to try and breed back a horse that looks like a conic horse. I mean, it looks like a tarpan. And they bred them with uh, conics with Przewalski's horses, Goatland ponies, and Icelandic horses. And by the 1960s, they produced the Heck horse. Uh, which has been used for Mustangs as well, so they kind of brought back that breed somehow. Though, we don't have much uh, studies on the genetics of uh, these kind of breeds and how much Tarpan is in them, or how much they actually are like the Tarpan. So, a pure Tarpan is pretty much extinct, uh, which is sad, but really, really interesting animal. I love that we got all these different colors, all just shown from uh, cave paintings and stuff like that, so that's really, really cool. Definitely a big fan. It's a really awesome mod, done by good boy and Genora Pizza, and nice to see the tarpans, or European wild horses as we to call them. But last and certainly not least, we've got a really cool mod here. This is done by good boy and Genora Pizza again. So this is one, uh, uh, thankfully he gave me early to review, hopefully it should be out by the time this comes out. If not, I'm just going to put the link in uh, when I edit it, uh, when it is released. So we've got here the Dire Wolf, or a Scion Durus, really, really awesome animal here. So the Dire Wolf, or a Scion Durus, is an extinct canid from North and South America, and is one of the most famous prehistoric carnivores. It's from the uh, Pleistocene, went extinct with the other late Pleistocene megafauna at the end of the Ice Age, which is really, really cool. So in terms of evolution, uh, before I want to talk about what makes it so weird. So originally it was kind of considered uh, its own... Uh, species of like in canis so it's considered its own species canis it had been split into its own genus and Sionduris back in the 1930s uh i mean yeah 1930s or something early 1900s um and was called like a terrible dog but then it was lumped into canis uh because it looked so similar uh, morphologically to uh like wolves and things like that 
But there was a recent study in 2021 that actually looked at the genetics of direwolves found in La Brea and actually showed that these guys are very, very basal to the family Canidae. So it's very likely um, when the Canidae was first evolving in America, the ancestors of most modern uh, dogs, so things like jackals, wild dogs, uh, and the ancestors of canids and dolls and things like that, left out of America and the ancestors of the uh, direwolf stayed in America and evolved to become the direwolf, leading to about 6 million years difference between the direwolf and the grey wolf, when they thought to be so closely related. And that's a great example of convergent evolution. So they're two animals that uh, were very distantly related, but came together and looked similar through evolution because they were doing similar things, as these guys were both large predators hunting large animals uh, in their ecosystem. Which is really really cool and it's cool that genetics proved us to that and i think that also makes it so much more interesting since there's six million years of evolution between them and it's like they wouldn't have looked exactly the same of course and allows for more creative license and makes die wolves i think so much more interesting so in terms of their description the average die wolf proportions is kind of the size of your like your largest uh, wolves today so they go a little bit bigger on average and quite a bit bulkier so the largest northern wolves today get to about a shoulder height of about 97 centimeters and about uh, 180 kilo, uh, 80 centimeter body length. So it's very likely that they got quite a bit larger than this, so maybe like a 190 uh, dire wolf, for example. In terms of weight, though, the average weight for a dire wolf was about 68 kilograms, about 150 pounds, and some specimens were larger, hence average. But we know that they couldn't get to about 110 kilograms or uh, so a uh, 100 kilogram wolf is quite possible, I'd say, so, which is quite big. And they were on average. So basically, the average dire wolf was the size uh, of a really large wolf today, a grey wolf. So they were quite a bit bigger and quite a bit bulkier, which is really, really interesting. And um, so I'd imagine like the biggest one probably up to 100 kilograms, that's what I would say. But in terms of their ecology, very, very interesting ecology. So they lived in North and South America and potentially up to Western Asia, as we'll get to. Uh, they evolved, uh, I believe, like in the Pleistocene or it would have been the Miocene and then into the Pleistocene, Pleistocene and Pleistocene. Uh, they lived in America with all sorts of charismatic megafauna that we know today. So things like mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, uh, smilodon, uh, American lions, uh, camels, horses, all sorts of animals like that, which they fed upon. And they lived, uh, we have, we know so much because of the La Brea Tar Pits, which has preserved thousands of individual direwolves, I think up to 4,000. So we have a great idea and a great sample size to figure out how big they got on average, uh, and um, things like that, talk about injuries, things like that, which is really, really cool. But we know from isotopes that these guys would have been eating uh, animals such as yesterday's camels, uh, Pleistocene bison, pronghorns, horses, paramylodon, which was a type of ground sloth, and really eating things like Colombian mammoths and American mesodons. And even we have evidence of them scavenging whales off the coast of California, which is really, really interesting. So you know they were eating that. And they would have been competing with smilodon and American lions uh, for those kind of prey. So they were um, eat, eating a lot of these guys, and they would eat mastodons, things like that. So pretty much hunting big animals. And we know from their bite forces as well, there's been some research into that, they would have had a really great uh, bite force of about 163 uh, kilograms of body weight, so quite huge. Uh, the closest uh, that we have today is the African hunting dog, so they were doing a lot, a little bit more than that, even more than like uh, spotted hyenas, which is quite interesting. So in terms of behavior, uh, like most uh, at La Brea, they would have been attracted to kind of animals dying in the tar. And an event like that would happen every 50 years and a bunch would get quite uh, attracted to these and obviously get stuck in the mud themselves or stuck in the tar themselves and preserve uh, lots of dire wolves for us to study uh, thousands of years later. So that's really, really cool. Uh, the differences between male and females apart from their sexual organs, since males have baculums, you can kind of tell them apart, it seems that they didn't have a uh, very distinctive uh, little dimorphism so quite similar to gray wolves that may have lived in monogamous pairs or um, they would have uh, lived in packs with a uh, alpha pair kind of uh, dictating everything 
And because of their large size and their dentition, these guys are most likely uh, large predators feeding on large prey. And they would have been able to uh, use their jaws to grapple and uh, bring down prey, which is quite interesting. And lived in quite large packs as well. And uh, these guys would have been uh, eating on prey between 300 to 600 kilograms, or about 660, 1,000 uh, 1,320 pounds, so very likely eating a lot of large things. Um, and stable isotopes show that these guys were eating ruminants, so eating bison, and then eating horses and things like that, and uh, scavenging on uh, beached whales when that's available. And a pack of timber wolves can bring out something like a, a half a ton or like 500 kilograms. So these guys are most likely bringing down larger animals like bison and horses and camels and potentially young mammoths and mastodons. So that's really, really cool, like running down prey and getting them tired, things like that. And um, they would have been able to crack larger bones because of their more powerful jaws. And we do have evidence of tooth breakage. Uh, these guys would have been had tooth breakage well in within the range of other species today. So they would have broken their teeth, but not as often as, or more often than modern species. So kind of the same rates as well. And we believe that they would have been affected by climates, of course, uh, as the climate changed throughout the ice ages, since there was lots of changes within uh, climates and things. There would have been all sorts of different changes and they had to adapt to that as well. That's really, really cool. Stresses, things like that. But in terms of competition, uh, these guys, uh, because living with the megafauna, they had very interesting competition. So at the beginning, when they just evolved, they would have had to compete with Xenocyon, which was as large as a dire wolf and more hypercarnivorous, but they went extinct early on. During the Pleistocene, they would have had to compete with many other large carnivores, such as Smilodon fatalis, the North American saber-toothed cat, uh, American lions, short-faced bears, pumas, uh, Pleistocene uh, coyotes, and many other large species like giant short-faced bears like Arctodus. And um, very interesting as well, we have Beringian wolves that lived in, uh, found in the Bighorn Mountains in the Western US. So it's very likely in areas where they would have mixed together, they would have competed. But uh, and then if there's this one from Amer uh, from the uh, Western Asia is true, they would have had to compete with animals from Asia, such as like cave hyenas and cave lions and things like that. But in terms of their range, they had quite a broad, broad range. They've been found across plains and grasslands and forests and mountains across North and South America. They seem to have ranged pretty much from north to south. With the uh, United States, there have been fossils found in California, Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, things like that. With, I believe, the youngest uh, found is about uh, like 14,000 years ago, but have typically uh, found all across the U.S., um, some have been found in Mexico and in South America. They've been found in Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, and Chile. So very, very wide range. Lived in all sorts of different habitats, preying on large animals. And um, in 2020, there was also a mandible found, which is really interesting, of a dire wolf found in Harbin, northeastern China. And these fossils were found uh, to be dated about 40,000 years ago. And it's believed that they could have actually crossed the Berrien Land Bridge uh, as evidenced by this and would have uh, got into America and um, Eurasia, I mean. And uh, though it's only one and it could be misidentified, I'm not sure how much stock we took into this, but it shows that they probably did actually manage to get to the uh, eastern uh, parts of uh, Asia, which is quite cool. But most likely they lived exclusively at the Americas. But what happened to these big, successful, hypercarnivorous super dogs, you could say, or these dire wolves, you know, that we love from Game of Thrones? Really, really awesome animals. I love the dire wolves, especially this design. Since they weren't so closely related to grey wolves, obviously looking quite different. So that's one we presented in this reconstruction, which I'm so happy with. But their extinction, let's get on about their extinction. Uh, they went extinct at a time with a lot of other large animals around the world, as known as the Pleistocene megafaunal extinction. So sadly, the dire wolf went extinct with a lot of these animals, such as mammoths, mastodons, cave hyenas, cave lions, ground sloths, uh, toxodonts, a lot of those glyptodonts, giant ground sloths, things like that. A lot of those animals went extinct within the past like 50,000 years. And we don't know why. There's been a lot of debate. Um, like climate change, competition with humans and other species around the world, 
uh, over exploitation by humans or a combination of factors or localized version of these factors. It's believed with dire wolves, potentially from competition and disease spread from uh, gray wolves coming into the Americas. Uh, they would have spread diseases and things like that. And because they were so distantly related to coyotes and hyenas, I mean, not hyenas, um, gray wolves, they wouldn't have been able to hybridize as evidenced by genetics. So they may have not been able to adapt to the certain diseases and things gray wolves brought along with them. And that could have led to their extinction. And um, also hunting and the loss of their large prey could have also led to their extinction. It could be a very multifaceted thing. But um, ancient DNA has been found that showed they went extinct in North America. And that's when things such as um, gray wolves kind of took their niche within the ecosystem uh, in America. And they would have hybridized with coyotes as well. That makes them more resistant to diseases. But the dire wolf would have been able to do that, being so distantly related, and went extinct. But these guys actually last uh, quite a long time. So the dire wolf, the youngest dire wolves that we have uh, from the youngest theological age is about 9,440 years uh, BP, uh, found in Missouri, and some from La Brea, found about nine to 10,000 years ago, and even one dated to about 8,000 years ago. So they did, oh, 8,000 or 10,000 years ago. So lived uh, quite recently. We uh, Only us recently missed out on them, but obviously a lot of ancient people saw them. But yeah, really, really cool. I just have to gush about this guy. I was going to commission a dire wolf. I didn't get the chance, but the lucky commissioner beat me to it and got Booga Boy to make a really wonderful wolf. And I love that it's not just a gray wolf because there's so much different uh, evolutionary time between them. They're separated by six million years almost. So there would have been a lot of uh, evolution going on. And even though they're so distant related, they converged and a very similar ecology, and uh, it's really, really cool. I really love this dire wolf. And uh, since we've got a little bit of a time, we're going to have a look at these cute little puppies. So cute little puppy dire wolves. Really, really awesome. A really, really awesome mod that I love from Good Boy. Really, really great job. So, um, yeah, I think this would be a great place to end the video. I'm going to thank all the modders for making these wonderful mods today, especially like the dire wolf and the echidna i feel like those two are like the highlights of today i'm really glad we've got those really cool species and i get to talk about them on this video so um yeah i uh really 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 hope you guys have enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything so yeah hope you guys enjoy this video hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye